Colorado's mountains are tens of millions of years old, with the exception of one peak formed within the last year. That would be Mount Vaccination, a peak in vaccine distributions in March and then a steady descent in doses given. We now live in a low plateau as vaccinations in Colorado slow to a trickle. It's not true, though, to say that every Coloradan who wants to get a vaccine has one. In a moment, we'll hear from Next at Night viewers sharing why they chose to get the shot just recently after months of hesitation. A layer on to the hesitation, barriers to access, like getting time off work. Our Victoria De Leon visited a community group in Denver offering vaccinations after business hours tonight, a place where only 10 more Coloradans got their shots. Ready, Freddie? Wednesday evening. My little brother is 12 years old. He just took his shot like a champ, uh, so he's braver than me. Sergio Matas and his brother Ivan. It, uh, it's just like a little pinch. Wanted to be part of the solution. The first? No. Nah. Not the problem. So really, I'm a little bit past due here. Um, I should have gotten this a long time ago. Sergio says he would have gotten his COVID-19 vaccine sooner, but working two jobs makes scheduling a little tough. But the idea with this site is to have a place open for people who are uh, working. Which is why Dr. Ricardo Gonzalez with Servicios de la Raza hopes offering more after hours community vaccine sites will help increase vaccination rates in Hispanics and Latinos. Clear. Especially with a more contagious strain spreading across communities. Yeah. And this is not going to be very good news. Uh, and this map is uh, different. Uh, projects that we have. As Delta variant cases increase, not enough shots are getting into the arms we still have two, four, six, eight. of people hardest hit by the pandemic. We had a lot at the beginning and then it just started to like drop. So the work to address access ¿Y por qué no se había vacunado usted antes? and misinformation barriers continues. Sí, no creo mucho la vacuna, pero... okay. As Dr. Gonzalez tries convincing people the solution to our problem. Eso fue todo. Is just a pinch away. Done. For next, I'm Victoria De Leon. We talked here last night about more private businesses leading the way on vaccine requirements if the government won't. Today, UC Health announced it's going to require all employees be fully vaccinated by October 1st. There will be exemptions for medical or religious reasons, but UC Health employees who just straight up refuse can get fired. Denver Health and Banner Health are also requiring employees to be fully vaccinated by November 1st. And the VA hospital is giving its employees until early October to get vaccinated. So employees here at Nine News put on masks about midday today when Denver's COVID situation was officially downgraded to substantial spread. CDC is recently recommending indoor mask wearing for everyone, vaccinated or not, in counties that have substantial or high transmission. More of Colorado now falls under that maddening description tonight, from 38 counties yesterday to 42 of them now. I say maddening because I have heard from so many of you frustrated that you did what you could to put COVID behind us. And yet here we are. Our Marshall Zellinger talked with two public health directors worried about the whiplash that comes with bringing back mask recommendations. The inconsistency has been uh, an enemy for all of us here in public health. Tom Gonzalez is the public health director in Larimer County, which has a seven-day COVID-19 transmission rate of 71 cases per 100,000. That puts the county in orange based on the CDC scale. Its positivity rate is 4.8 percent. Health experts want that less than 5 percent. And 60 percent of the county's residents have at least one vaccine dose. Yet he and other public health directors are now weighing the options for indoor mask requirements based on new New CDC guidance. I want to hear what what our, our state epidemiologists and our state health officer has to say and hear all of those facts. And if it is in line with the CDC, absolutely, we follow CDC guidance. Some of the CDC's new guidance is based on studies from India with vaccines not authorized for use in the U.S., which show high viral loads of Delta variant, regardless of vaccination status. But here are the CDC's guiding principles for fully vaccinated people. Most indoor activities pose low risk to fully vaccinated people. Farther down, wear a mask in public indoor settings if they are in an area of substantial or high transmission. The CDC considers the 42 counties in orange or red substantial or high transmission areas, like Larimer and Denver. We can't continue our face coverings forever. 
And I think it's going to be challenging if we bounce back and forth. Bob McDonald is the director of Denver's Department of Public Health. Denver has a transmission rate of 56 per 100,000, 3.2 percent positivity, and 72 percent of residents have at least one vaccine dose. Last year, Denver was the first to order masks worn indoors, two months before the state mandated it, though McDonald is not requiring it again for vaccinated people just yet. But we expect in the next few days we'll be rolling out some information, and some guidance along those lines. For Next at Night, I'm Marshall Zellinger. So we're just kind of stuck here if we can't move vaccination rates. Generalizing about why people choose not to get vaccinated is not particularly helpful. I asked Next at Night viewers who recently got vaccinated why they waited and why they changed their minds. Here are four. Corey Gaines, Sterling, vaccinated in July, said he's young and healthy, doesn't fear COVID, and didn't like being talked down to. He got the shot when it felt rational to him. The thing that's been particularly unfair is to paint the entirety of small towns, rural America, conservative areas. Uh, with that brush of saying, well, you know, they're too stupid to make their own decisions, so it has to be Facebook. So therefore, we must clamp down on misinformation. Laura Littman, Brighton, vaccinated July 20th. I was nervous. I had reservations about how it was made, how it was tested, how quickly it came off the assembly line. She says she's not an anti-vaxxer just cautious. This ultimately wasn't something I did for everybody else. This was a decision that I made for me. Will McCollum, Denver, vaccinated today, had to wait after he caught COVID right before he could get vaccinated. What are you waiting for? Don't you like Rockies games? Don't you like Broncos games, concerts, bars, people? You know, I, I love going to the office. I hope you do too. Um, you know, if we want our lifestyle back, if we want sports, if we want bars and concerts, get vaccinated. It's a very straightforward process. Kenny Happ, Fort Collins. He had COVID this spring. His mother died of it. He blames himself. Losing a parent uh, hurts. Um, knowing that you gave COVID to that parent hurts even more. And I don't want that to happen to another parent. And I don't want that happen to my neighbors and my friends and my loved ones. Kenny got the vaccine before going to see his dad. He's appreciative. Um, he knows what I'm going through with my mom. And uh, he's like, take the weight off your shoulders. You know, don't, don't be afraid to come see me once you got these shots. But, you know, take the weight off your shoulder a little bit for Colorado's vaccine stories. The path to the Olympics brought Team USA's boxing team and its shooters to, of all places, a shopping mall. Matt Renew, mall reporter, joins us from the Citadel Mall in Colorado Springs. Hey, Matt. Hi, Kyle. Yeah, this is one of the most unlikely places for this story. It is an abandoned department store at the Citadel Mall used to be a Macy's, but it's where USA Shooting and USA Boxing set up their rings and their range so that they could train. An abandoned Colorado Springs department store might seem like an unlikely stop on the road to the Tokyo Olympics, but not for USA Boxers and Team USA Shooters where the men and women's departments of this department store turned out to be the perfect places to set up their training headquarters during the pandemic. When the United States Olympic Training Center closed, these teams found this empty 96,000 square foot department store and set up their boxing rings and an entire shooting range all so they could train, keeping their COVID plans in place and they're perfect for social distancing. I think we're technically in women's intimates here with the uh, air rifle range and uh, and the boxing team is over in the men's department. So it's kind of uh, it's kind of funny. You've got two of the most successful Olympic teams in U.S. history between boxing and shooting. Uh, we've won over 230 uh, medals in Olympic competition, and we're here set up at the old Macy's at Citadel Mall. And it's working. USA Shooting having a great Olympics, bringing in a lot of medals. And they're not the only ones that have been doing weird things. USA Weightlifting set up in Hawaii during the Olympics so that they wouldn't have to train 
in Japan. And, you know, they cleared this thing out, Kyle, for the most part of everything that's in it. But while we've been waiting to go live, we've been looking around, and look what I found. A little something I think you might like to put on. Huh? Oh, look at that. That's, that's gorgeous. Yeah. And if we're serious, Matt, about, about using Colorado's empty spaces to train Olympians, the diving team needs to get to Casa Bonita. Stat. Matt Renew, Mall Reporter. I, I love that idea. Thanks, sir. Hey, so each Wednesday on Next, we do a fun little group project. We pull together $5 contributions from any person who's willing to make one huge donation to a great nonprofit in Colorado. $5 at a time. Next viewers have raised $4.2 million since last year. Figure we should keep the tradition alive on Next at Night. So our Word of Thanks microgiving campaign this week supports the National Sports Center for the Disabled, which opens the door of sports to Coloradans who didn't think it was possible. Their mission is simple and beautiful, a belief that everyone is able and anything is possible. You, you know these folks. They've been the leaders in adaptive outdoor sports for a half century. Certainly technology and sports evolve just like equipment and coaching methods evolve, but their determination to make outdoor sports accessible that's what matters most. So they've got the adaptive ski school, rock climbing, kayaking, paddleboarding, horseback riding. The National Sports Center for the Disabled has been such a fixture in Colorado for generations. I probably don't need to tell you about their life-changing programs for people who are living with a disability and injured military veterans. What I didn't know until I called them up is that they had a transportation van stolen and then another van and trailer break down on them. I'm thinking we could help with that. Text thanks to 303-871-1491 and I will send you a link to donate. I'll never ask you to give to something that I don't support myself. So as always, I'll match the first 50 donations of $5. There are amazing adaptive sports adventures waiting for Coloradans. The National Sports Center for the Disabled just needs a bit more help getting people to those events and back. And I bet together we can make that happen. Two degrees does not sound like a lot. I mean, that's only a third of the way to Kevin Bacon. A two degree warm up in Colorado's average temperatures has changed life for us and every other living thing here. He probably could have made the Olympic rugby team. He chose the star and stripes of Liberia instead. I say we root for him anyway. And this rocks a long drive to meet one of Colorado's heaviest celebrities. The one that rolled into our lives suddenly and was just too big to move. Next. Colorado is getting hotter. States warmed up around two degrees over the last couple of decades. Two degrees that have had a measurable impact on our water supply, our forests, wildlife, and how we just live day to day. Anusha Roy takes a look at what's in a degree. Talking specific numbers and climate change almost does a disservice. At least that's what climate experts say. People don't really connect to that. Here's our attempt to make it more relevant. Colorado's average temperature warmed up by around one and a half degrees Fahrenheit in the last 30 years and two degrees when you look at the max temperatures. Assistant state climatologist Becky Bollinger says be careful before you brush that off. You think well, it's like the difference between 90 degrees and 92 degrees. There's not really a big difference. So, so what's the big deal? Um, but there's a lot that goes into changing that number. It might help to think about it in these terms. Really, everybody's talking about the heat. Think about the number of 90 degree days we've had and the 100 degree spree we endured as well. In the 1980s, you probably only saw about 20 to 30 90 degree days and they were considered you know the really hot days but uh that wasn't uh really the normal for summer we can pull back for an even bigger picture these heat extremes these heat waves with the state expected to keep warming it doesn't bode well for our drought just the western half of the state that is still in that sustained uh where we've exceeded now 40 weeks of extreme drought it's also interconnected with our wildfire season, our water supply that's already being tested. Not just the daytime temperature, it's the nighttime temperature. And how we live every day. Those cool nights are really important, especially for the thousands upon thousands of people who do not have air conditioning in their homes because it was never needed. If you're in construction, if you're a utility worker, if you're someone who cares for children and you want them to play outside, then more 90 degree, degree days is a serious problem. 
So this caught my attention about the modeling that was actually from back in 2006 was predicting what was going to happen now. Talking just big picture here with climate patterns, the climate experts we talked to said even though they forecasted this so long ago, most of it was on point. And those same models are now showing anywhere from a two and a half degree to five degree increase by 2050, Kyle, when you are comparing them to temps back in the 1970s to 2000. I think it's, it's easy, Anusha, in the face of an issue that's global to feel like we are kind of very personally powerless. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I mean, that is one thing that I heard from everyone I talked to, that they didn't want people to kind of freeze and not know what to do because everybody can play a little bit of a role. The big one is going to be businesses, corporations, cities, and states leading the way, but also you, me, neighbors, we could plant trees, we could start composting, recycling, all of that kind of just starts adding together. And I know that we just basically scratched, barely scratched the surface here with this story. So we are going to actually start a series where we're talking about a whole bunch of different issues with Colorado's climate. And the next one will be focusing on our water supplies and well, again, what we can all do about it. Mm -hmm. So much to delve into here. The issue of shade itself and shade cover in cities is yep. fascinating. And the idea of do people get cool nights to cool their bodies? Everybody thinks about the cool days yeah. but, or the hot days, but it's the hot nights that are physically dangerous to people. Exactly. And there are some people who had no choice that, you know, during our summer because they didn't have AC. They never needed it. And now the city is looking at their options to try to help them out. Anusha, thank you. It was a hot one today, 100 degrees, breaking a record set back in 1876. Yes, 1876. Not the only area that hit 100 today. 101 in Sydney, Sterling, Ogallala, 102 in Scottsbluff, and 100 in Lamar. Dominant ridge of high pressure pushing the storm track to the north, allowing in just enough moisture for thunder showers west of the Continental Divide and maybe an isolated storm over the Front Range late in the day tomorrow. But for the most part, another warm, dry day should be expected tomorrow with air quality alerts posted. Fair skies in 60s tonight, back to the mid 90s tomorrow, but we do get relief by the weekend. Cooler 80s on Saturday, 70s on Sunday with a good chance of rain from storms both days. The U.S. is tied atop the medal count, but Liberia is not greedy. They just want one medal, nation's first ever Olympic medal, which is why we are also rooting for a second team in red, white, and blue. Let's get that Liberian national anthem and let's meet one of the three athletes tonight. Emmanuel Matadi, Liberian sprinter, competes in the men's 100 meter on Saturday and the 200 meter on Tuesday. He's the middle guy in yellow, very fast. Second Olympic Games for him. He also competed for Liberia in Rio in 2016. His family moved to the U.S. from Liberia when he was in middle school. He played football, then got into track. Guy super athletic. He also plays rugby. He could have tried to play rugby for the U.S. Olympic team but he decided that he wanted to compete for his long shot homeland. Maybe Matadi is the man who changes the zero into a one for Liberia on the medal count. We are the only news program in Denver that reliably shows you the Liberian medal count, just the value that you get with Next at Night. The opening of Colorado's newest roadside attraction caused a small earthquake. I think it was 2.8 on the Richter scale out of the site at Mesa Verde. Boom, here come the tourists. What they're looking for, they're looking for that selfie with the big rock. We are headed to far southwest Colorado to meet a rock star next. There are towns in Colorado that spend millions to attract tourists. Dolores had its tourist attraction fall on its lap fall on a highway specifically. Our Mark Salinger and photojournalist Ann Herps are on the road rediscovering Colorado, including that one road through Dolores. Isn't Colorado just the best? We've got biking and hiking trails. We've got lots of camping. The big question, how do we pick where to stop? Isn't there a big rock around here, Ann? Tourists like us always ask that, Mark. I bet this rock shop in Cortez will know where to go. They come in and I'll answer questions for an hour. Sharon Sanchez at San Juan Gems is used to people like us. I kind of like these green guys. What are those? Uh, that is called Vesuvianite. And these are not dinosaur bones, Those are right? not dinosaur bones. Apparently, we're those tourists with way too many questions. And we've got lapis, a plume agate, bloodstone from Africa, petrified dinosaur poop. Were you expecting to see that on our road trip? We polished a turd. Uh, no. 
I'm here for the big boulder near Dolores. What do you know about that, Sharon? Want to know about it coming down and how long it's been there? And... Big rock, estimated uh, 8 million pounds. How did this get here? Yo, Mark, how about you look up there? Sitting, you can see where it come off of that rim rock and then slowly made its way down here. Todd Jones used to work for CDOT. He was one of the first on scene, but may have felt it before he saw it. I think it was 2.8 on the Richter scale. It also shook up tourism a little bit when they decided to build the road around it instead of blow it up. People want to know, you know, what is one thing that distinguishes you from everyone else? And now we've got a big, huge 8 million pound rock. <laughs> Susan Lysak works for the Chamber of Commerce in Dolores and fields lots of rock related questions. It, it rolled down the weekend of Memorial Day weekend. Even when someone unexpected asks about it. When I heard that Governor Polis was coming, I was actually pleasantly surprised. The governor came down, presented the, the road signs that are now installed on the highway that uh, Mark Memorial Rock. It might not be worth much to share. Could you sell that rock down here? No. But for tourists driving through, it's hard to pass up. Too bad there's not a ladder to get on top of that rock. It'd be nice to have a picnic up there. No question, a Colorado road trip rocks. Seriously, did we really have to end the story like that? Welcome to our camp, Kyle. Not too bad, right? Yeah, earlier today, a ranger came here to tell us there's been bears frequenting the area. So if you don't hear from us tomorrow, uh, contact Mancus State Park and have them start looking for us, please. <laughs> Hopefully that won't happen, though. You, you, guys, you guys will be fine. Remember, uh, get big, make noise. Uh, you two are way too relaxed on this road trip. Hardly qualifies it as work. And Mark, thanks so much. It's almost bedtime. It is almost bedtime. Good night to you both. Enjoy your celebratory beverage. We are back with our group project tonight, helping a legendary Colorado nonprofit get past a little stumbling block so it can keep delivering adaptive sports experiences to people with disabilities and injured vets. That's next. Wednesday tradition on next. Our word of thanks microgiving campaign this week is helping the National Sports Center for the Disabled. One of their transportation vans was stolen, another van and trailer broke down. That longtime nonprofit, 50 years plus, has all of their adaptive outdoor sports experiences ready and waiting uh, for Coloradans. They got the skiing that everybody knows, plus kayak and horseback riding and rock climbing. They just could use our help getting participants there and back to those programs. Text the word thanks to 303 871 1491. I will send you a link. You can take a look, see what you think. If you'd like, join me and a bunch of other Coloradans in donating. Even $5 helps, and together it adds up quick. Next, viewers have raised four points. $2 million through these Word of Thanks campaigns for various nonprofits since last year. Always on the lookout for your ideas of which nonprofit we should feature next. You sent me about 200 ideas earlier this week for next week's campaign. Jake Miller wrote in tonight, said, oh, we love volunteering for the National Sports Center for the Disabled, love the outdoor engagement and all the fun that they have each year on the mountain. Jesse Payne writes in on vaccine, says, what if we stopped protecting those who don't want protection? personal responsibility is long overdue. I think we need to remember there are immunocompromised folks, there are kids under 12 who can't be vaccinated, and then there's the petri dish effect the longer we let this go on. 